Biology at Tulane University of Medicine after receiving his doctorate in 1979 from the University of Texas Health Science <clears throat> Center at Dallas. He then completed the National Research Associate at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in Washington, DC. Some of the places where I ran across some of his work was when he chaired the committee to review all military infectious disease research for the Department of Defense. He's also a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Marine Corps. Sir, I thank you not only for your service to our country, but for your long, hard work in terms of tackling and combating infectious disease. Dr. John. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about this really important subject, actually. I was uh, looking through some of my notes and I, I, I was remembering the quote that we all remember from uh, Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. The end of that quote, though, is one less noted. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. And that's kind of where we find ourselves right now in terms of this COVID infection. We are in the winter of despair, but we are looking at a spring of hope because of the advent of these two new vaccines that have recently been approved or will soon be approved by the FDA. The Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, they're both based upon a type of technology that heretofore and for the last 30 years has never ever been shown to work in humans. So I was fairly skeptical about this from the outset, but uh, the value of being an academic is that my skepticism can be overcome by facts. And so uh, when I look at all the data from these, I have become convinced that they are safe and effective vaccines. I'm less sanguine about the other versions that are coming down the pike. We can talk about those if you want to, but these two versions uh, are safe and have about a 95% efficacy. That being said, there are some things about these that we need to keep in mind and important to remember. The first is that vaccines, no matter how good they are, don't actually prevent infections, they prevent disease. So even if you take a vaccine or you have the disease and you recover, you can still be infected again. You just may not develop disease which means that you could still transmit the infection to someone else. And that's one of the things we really don't know about the current vaccines or even having been infected with the, the disease itself is whether or not you could still infect other people, which is one of the primary concerns that we have. Another thing that we don't know is we don't know what the, the protective, how long you're protected after you've been vaccinated or whether, uh, or even if you've had the disease. In most diseases that we're familiar with, you can get long-term protection by having survived or even by having been vaccinated with a really good vaccine. But in some cases, that's not true. Now with flu, we have to get revaccinated every year because the flu virus is very adaptable. And so every time each year, we're looking at a new variant. That's not the case with this particular RNA virus. And so uh, we just don't know. We, if we don't have long-term protection, it won't be because the virus is changing. It will be because we don't yet have a way to develop the kind of immunity that we need for that time, type of protection. We don't know if it will prevent transmission. We don't know, uh, we don't know that there will not be other variants that come along. And one of the things that I, I've heard people say, well, here we have a disease that 99% of people recover from. So why should we be taking the vaccine, particularly if you're in your 20s or your 30s and you're not in some sort of risk group? And the reason is because that vaccines are not just for individuals, they're also for populations. So when you look at those statistics that says it's 95% eff efficacious, it doesn't mean that it, that it's really that it, that for you as an individual that you're necessarily going to fall into that 95 percent you may fall into the five percent for reasons we don't understand and there's a range of protection in there that probably range from people with as low as 60 percent and some with higher protection and because of that range as an individual you can't rely on the fact that you got a vaccine to think that that's some sort of a suit of armor that's gonna protect you against all exposure. 
So even if you have the vaccine, particularly for the next eight months or so, we need to continue to do those things that we are doing currently or should be doing currently in terms of wearing masks and social distancing and hand washing and, and, and just engaging in good responsible thinking uh, about what the situation is. Uh, and it's gonna take that long to roll these vaccines out into the community at large so that enough of us have immunity so we can break the transmission cycle and then we can start going back to a more normal life style uh, like we had before. Although, you know, in New Orleans, we say uh, that, you know, it'll never be August the 28th again. And that's in reference to Hurricane Katrina because it hit on August the 29th of 2005. And I said at the time that whatever developed in New Orleans after that point would not be, New Orleans would change and it would change forever. It may be better, it may be worse, but, but it was not gonna be the same. It would never be August the 28th again. And we're never gonna go back to, 19, to, to 2019 again, that we will always now be mindful of the fact that this thing or something like it is out there. And a lot of our behavior will change as a society for some time to come. I don't know when people are gonna be ready to start going back to theaters or going back to nightclubs or going back to you know large groups uh, or if now our behavior will change offices you know a, a number of these uh, companies that discovered they don't need to maintain office buildings they can have people work from home for a lot less that may not change back and what we're going to have I think for the time being is anxiety now and what we all have to deal with is anxiety of people while they're waiting their turn to get the vaccine. I mean, for my own group, I will probably be June before, and even though I'm in an older group, I'm not in a healthcare profession, I'm not in a nursing home, I'm not in any of those target populations that are gonna put me early in the line. It's gonna be May or June. And for people like me, in that time period when you're waiting, I liken that to the time period when you're in the water, your ship has sunk, you're in the water waiting to be picked up, and the first lifeboat shows up and there's not enough room for you and there are sharks in the water and you're sitting there anxiously waiting your turn for your lifeboat to show up so you can get out of the water and we're going to have a lot of people like that and i think we're all going to have to deal and help people deal with that anxiety as we go forward so carl sent me a list of questions most of which i'm not going to be able to answer so maybe we could just open it up for discussion and see if anybody has any specific questions Dr. John, there was a very good one. How can faith leaders best encourage people to receive the vaccination? Do we know where clergy are in the line for vaccinations? Uh, Felicia, I can answer the second part of that one at a later point because for Colorado, it's a little different from other places. So on that number, that actually is going to vary from state to state. Uh, and everyone gets to, uh, every state is going to have its own rules for how, how they, uh, where they fall in. For instance, I went to the dentist this morning and I found out that they are actually in the first group. I'm happy they are, by the way. I was surprised that they were in the first group. I thought it would be for people in intensive care units, but at least in Dadeville, Alabama, they're in the first group. And so every state is going to have its own rules. As to how we encourage people, I've always believed that the best way to encourage individuals is to inform them, keep them informed about what the real facts are on the ground and and help them make the decision based on those facts. Uh, there's so much information out there, misinformation out there, that our responsibility is to provide people with accurate information and help them understand, uh, understand the, the situation at hand and have faith that they will come to that in their own, on their own, and most people will. Uh, not seeing any other questions, I'm going to uh, ask one of the questions off that you and I addressed earlier, and that is, where do you see children and pregnant women coming into play in this process of vaccination? So, so we, so, so, so here, here's the thing. <laughs> this vaccine has not been tested in pregnant women and children. 
It's not been tested in anyone under the age of 16 months of age. Now, during the course of the Pfizer trial, five women became pregnant and there were no untoward effects on either the mother or the developing fetus. But that's not enough to say anything about and no one has specifically uh, has specifically targeted that question. So it's not even going to be possible to give this to children until we actually do the studies to show that it is safe in children. And you're not going to get to children until you get to adolescence. So there was a lot of discussion about whether the Pfizer vaccine could be given to 16 and 17 year olds because there were not enough of them in the trial to really make that statement. The FDA allowed it anyway because this is a uh, because of the nature of this approval, but no one below the age of 16. So that's not a question we're even gonna need to address anytime in the near future. Ultimately, if the vaccine were safe in children and pregnant women, then absolutely. But right now, that's not a question that it, that's gonna need an answer to because we don't, those studies are yet to be done and no one is gonna give it to them uh, without that having gone through enough safety tests to know that. We just completed a vaccine trial in Bangladesh where we went down to six month old babies for a diarrheal disease vaccine we've been developing. And we had to start with adults in the US, adults in Bangladesh, teenagers in Bangladesh, older children in Bangladesh, you know, adolescents in Bangladesh, uh, and work our way down through toddlers to finally get to six month old babies. And that took three or four years for us to get there. No one's going to jump through that that fast. So, so it's not an issue yet at the moment, Carl. Uh, one of the next questions were, what are your thoughts about leadership dealing with persons who can, cannot or will not accept the vaccination? Colorado projects that 66% will not receive the vaccination what does that mean for future gatherings? So the, the cannot is different than the will not. The cannot, because people who, particularly with this particular set of vaccines, these are going to be safer for immunocompromised individuals or people who have comorbidities than that next series of vaccines that are the, the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca, because those are live attenuated virus vaccines and they should not be given to anyone who's immunocompromised. There are people who can't take those and people who shouldn't take this one if they have hypersensitivity. If you carry an EpiPen, you shouldn't be taking this vaccine. And that, that's the whole point of vaccinology as a, as a societal event, because if enough of us who can take the vaccine take it, we break the transmission cycle so those who can't take the vaccine can also be protected. Um, for those who won't take the vaccine, and I've dealt with this ever since you know, Andrew Wakefield came out with his nonsense about the association of autism and the MMR vaccine, uh, about people who refuse to have their children vaccinated because uh, they think that it's associated with MMR. And what I've come to understand is that people who come to their conclusions through, illogic, through illogical mechanisms cannot be dissuaded by logical arguments. You know, there's nothing I can say to them that's going to change their mind. And my saying, well, I'm right and you're wrong, is not going to convince them that they need to change their behavior. That's just not going to happen. But I, what I do think will happen is that 66% number or whatever that percentage is, that, that, or the, the 30 or 40% that said they won't take the vaccine, that when the reality of the vaccine is in front of them, they will change their mind. It's easy to say no when it's a theoretical and you're not, and, 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 and it's not an option for you. Once the reality of that happens and their neighbors are getting vaccinated and you know they can see that it's safe and, and things are moving along, I think that number will reduce dramatically and people will fall in and will just decide that they're gonna take it. They may never announce it to you, by the way, but I think that, that their opinions will change when the lifeboat shows up your heroism will change. Your decision to fight the sharks will go away when the lifeboat shows up. You're going to crawl on the lifeboat with everybody else when that time comes. Uh, for those who absolutely positively will not, there's nothing you or I or anyone else can say that changes that. What we do hope is that they don't get sick and enough of the rest of us get protection 
protected and we break the transmission cycle so that they are protected that God takes care of them. I mean, there's really not a whole lot that we can do that will change their opinion if, 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 if their opinion was not formed through science or through information or logic. You can throw them a life jacket, but you can't make them put it on. I'd be interested in Dr. Clemens' thoughts on some of the other vaccines coming down the pike, timing of those, and how we can best manage the presence and messaging of multiple vaccinations at play. So <clears throat> this is uh, both an advantage and disadvantage to where we are right now. So I'm going to do a little geek talk with you for just a minute. So, so excuse me, but it's, it's, you know, I think it's necessary to sort of paint a picture. These two vaccines that we have right now are the same vaccine developed by two different manufacturers and they're based on what's called messenger RNA. The next two vaccines that are coming through are made by Johnson and Johnson and AstraZeneca in uh, collaboration with Oxford University. And that's based on taking an attenuated adenovirus and inserting DNA, uh, DNA that represents the, the coronavirus and infecting people with that. That's a live attenuated virus. And in fact, many of our vaccines are live attenuated virus vaccines. Measles, mumps, rubella are all live attenuated viruses. And they're generally they're safe. Adenovirus is a different circumstance, but nonetheless, generally they're safe. They shouldn't be given to immunocompromised individuals. And, and they will be approved. My problem with them is, is not that. The, the advantage of them is they're single dose rather than multiple dose. They can be stored at room temperature or at least at closer to room temperature than the extreme temperatures we have to store the others at. And for a global vaccine, they're probably a really good choice because they're inexpensive, five cents a dose can be distributed throughout the world. But they only have about 62 to 65% efficacy, at least the one that we know about does. And, uh, and if we have vaccines that have 95% efficacy, why would we do that? You know, uh, for us, it really doesn't seem to me to make a lot of sense for that. But nonetheless, that we will want or more of those is likely to be approved, uh, and it will be available. If you take one, though, if you take the if you take the Pfizer, you cannot subsequently take the Johnson and Johnson vaccine or even the Moderna vaccine. If you take the Pfizer vaccine, you have to be boosted with the Pfizer vaccine. If you take the Moderna, you have to be boosted with the Moderna. And if it doesn't work in you, you can't go take the other one. Because what we understand about the immune system tells us that you can really send it in directions you don't want to send it when you start mixing and matching. The next vaccine that comes along is going to be by a company called Novavax. And it's a more traditional vaccine where they're just taking protein from the virus and mix it together in a tube with an immune enhancer we call an adjuvant and that will get injected intramuscularly. And that will also be a pretty good and safe vaccine, although I don't know what the efficacy will be. So those are the five that we're likely to see in the United States anytime while this pandemic is still, is still in play. Uh, after a year, uh, I'm confident that we're not going to be dealing with COVID the way that we're dealing with it right now. We may eventually have a, a cold, flu, and COVID season, uh, but we'll have a vaccine strategy and we'll have residual immunity that will help keep it at bay. And it will be something that we won't have nearly the problem with that we're having right now. But those five vaccines, it's going to be, it's going to be August before we have enough of any of those vaccines to immunize the population at large, because they're going to start with the, the vaccines that we can account for right now are not even enough to cover all of our first responders and uh, uh, elderly people in nursing homes and essential personnel. Uh, when you put all of those together, we don't have enough to even immunize half of those. And we don't have enough schedule to even immunize that group. So, and we don't, we're not looking for delivery of more before March. <clears throat> so no matter what the rosy scenarios are, the math is, uh, is gonna control this. They can only manufacture so many doses. They've committed those doses in some cases to other countries. The US's position in that is that we will receive a certain amount that 
on a certain schedule that by March and April, we should start be getting enough for people in my age group and condition, maybe June, but in that time frame. But for the population at large, it's going to be much further down the road than that, no matter what happens. But by the end of next year, by the end of 2021, this will be in our rearview mirror and we'll have some semblance of normalcy by fall of next year. Uh, but uh, the vaccines are the ones that are in the, the ones that we know about, the ones that are at any possibility of reaching us in 2021 are already in the pipeline and already cooked. We already know what the what the logistics are to get those and it's going to be august or so before we have an abundant enough supply for you to walk down to your walgreens and get your covid shot but the two that we have right now but one that we have pfizer and the other is going to get approved tomorrow so the moderna vaccine so by next week <laughs> we'll start seeing the moderna vaccine out there so those two are the two that we are going to rely on for the short term, and uh, and and they're actually two pretty good choices. We're very fortunate at that, but they came through first. Another question that came in the chat box, Doctor: If people are vaccinated, can they gather for in-person worship? Do you think they need to show proof that they've been vaccinated? There is no mechanism in a free society whereby we're going to do that. Uh, so we don't, we're not going to get ear tags or chips or even ID cards that tell us that uh, no matter what Rush Limbaugh says, we're not going to get chipped so they can, so Bill Gates can follow us around. Uh, it's just not going to happen. And so, so can we gather? Uh, we rely on each other. We rely in faith on each other for a lot of things. And if we can't rely in faith on each other for that, then I think we probably are not having the right conversation. So if we say to our brothers and sisters in faith that if you've been vaccinated and you wish to gather in this condition, then please come. If you haven't been, please don't come. I take it on faith that they will do that. And if one or two sneak through the door, it's not going to be that big a deal if the majority of people have been vaccinated. One person or two people is not going to break that cycle in a large group. The better question for me is, should you even be gathering in large groups even when everybody's been vaccinated? We don't know that you won't still be able to harbor the virus and transmit it to other people. So even though you're gathering in a group of individuals who have been vaccinated, if you get infected, again, it prevents disease, not infection, and you then go transmit that outside to somebody else who was not part of your group, you've defeated the whole purpose. You may have protected, be protected in that small group, but you have no way of knowing that everybody in that group is that no one in that group is transmitting the virus to other people in that group who will then go out into the community at large. And until we get to the point where we break the transmission cycle, our better answer is not to be gathering in groups, whether you've got your little V card or not, is not to be gathering in large groups until we break that cycle. That's not an answer though, that's, that's a science answer, that's not a faith answer. That's not something that, that I can answer for anybody who has to make that decision. That's just the facts uh, of it. It's been reported that the Moderna vaccine is less effective in people over 65. Does that mean the younger populations should get the Moderna and, a, and older populations the Pfizer vaccination? Or do we get or have a choice? And I know that that question, the second part of that's almost speculative. So, well, the, the, the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccines are essentially the same vaccine. And the, the difference in their efficacy by age group is not significantly different. So I, to me right now, 
whatever vaccine, if you have a choice of either of those vaccines, take it. Take it and run to the bank because either one of those is going to remember again, those statistic numbers are about populations. They're not about individuals. So in you, if you're over 65, that Moderna vaccine may give you 100% protection and it may give you 35%. We don't know. And you can't know for any of those because a lot depends upon circumstances beyond your control. I always use cholera as an example because I spend my life working in enteric diseases. Uh, that even if I took a very effective cholera vaccine, and there is no such thing, by the way, but if I took a very effective cholera vaccine, I still would not drink raw sewage. Because any vaccine can be overwhelmed by a high enough challenge. So no matter what your vaccine is, the, the numbers they're looking at are people who were exposed in, in nature to a variety of circumstances. They didn't tell them not to wear masks. They didn't tell them to start gathering in groups. They didn't tell them to stop hand washing. That was just a population looking at those different times over the course of that uh, clinical trial that gave you that answer. For any individual, you can't know the answer to that question. And so your protection can be overwhelmed by a high enough challenge. So if somebody really blew in your face with a lot of virus, even if you're immunized, you can still get the disease. And so it's not, it's not, you're not bulletproof. And so it, it, I think people need to really understand that, that at best, this gives you an element of, it's, it's the fence you put around your yard. But even if I have a fence around my yard, that doesn't mean I shouldn't lock my front door. It just means I have a really nice fence. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Cummins. I appreciate that. Um, According to uh, uh, Carl, Mike has captured the rest of these. We apologize if we can't get to all these questions. So I'm going to be the bad guy and come in here and say uh, that we can't get to all. But uh, hopefully, Dr. Cummins can answer them offline and we will uh, communicate those widely. This has been recorded too and will be also up on the leadership news as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Clements, uh, for, for all your wonderful knowledge and for taking time for here. Uh, and then the bishop has something to tell us. Thank you. Um, and to everybody, I've been getting some communications and Alex and I have both been getting communications about where do we find ourselves now that the Supreme Court has ruled about the state not being able to impose restrictions, restrictions on uh, congregational church gatherings, um, et cetera. Uh, and I wanna be clear, while I have encouraged folks to follow the, the state guidelines. Um, I've also been, I hope, pretty clear that I see those as the bare minimum of that which we can do to protect one another. And that my expectation is that as followers of Jesus, we will go above and beyond the expectation. And so I'm gonna say it to you all who are on the call, there's gonna be a letter that goes out later uh, uh, this week um, that I am strongly recommending that all congregations transition back to virtual worship um, through January, uh, the middle of January, if not the end. Um, but I'm leaving final decisions about worship in the hands of the clergy and lay leaders of each congregation. Um, we should make whatever sacrifice we have to make to protect the most vulnerable. And if you determine that you have to meet in person, I ask that those gatherings take place outdoors when possible. And if they're indoors, that no more than 25 people be present, be present and in all of the things that we do, that we always employ wearing masks and observing proper physical distance. So that's gonna be coming out um, in writing towards you. And I know this is difficult and I know that we're all tired of COVID and the fatigue is real. And at the same time, if what we do right now makes a difference for folks seeing another Christmas, I think we should make those sacrifices whenever possible. So well, that's- Bishop, Yeah, there's a question. Do you mean uh, communion distribution as well? Or is it just worship? Um, it's, person for it's the gathering of bodies in space and time. So yes.
great thanks uh bishop anything else that's all i have thank you dr clements for your wonderful um explanations and I am definitely going to be stealing your line uh, about my skepticism being overcome by facts. I love it. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it has been my pleasure and I was not my intention to disparage the vaccines by uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca, uh, but we have two really good vaccines before us. Uh, but if the FDA approves any of these vaccines, they'll be safe for us to take under the conditions in which they uh, which they are prescribed. I have, actually, I have great faith in the people at the FDA and I think they, they have done an excellent job. So my last word on that would just be, to, it, it may be the winter of despair, but it is the spring of hope. And we have some really good things coming down the line and, and it will be available to us. All right, so to close us out, I'm going to uh, impose on my Canon for formation. Would you like to close us in prayer, Greg? Thank you, Bishop. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Keep us good, Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and su support the anxious and the fearful and lift up all who are brought low that we may rejoice in your comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Carl? Yes, John. Good to talk to you. This has been a joy and a privilege, sir. Have a good Christmas. Take care. Merry you Christmas, too. everyone. <laughs>